Hey everybody, sorry about the technical difficulties from Sunday, but I wanted to cover real quick what we talked about. We only need a short amount of teaching time, but uh, I wanted to go over this so that you could look at it before our next class. So this is from part seven of the Way of the Cross called the Handling Emotions section, and it's the very first part of that. So it's a simple illustration to help us understand how our thoughts and emotions work together. So we have the thinker and we have the feeler. Both of them go up from 1 to 10 very quickly. Uh, they shoot on up there depending on where we're setting our mind. And, but they come down at a much different pace. The thinker will calm down much more quickly than the feeler. If you think of the, the thinker as a glass of water and you drop a pellet in it, the water is going to offer up some resistance, but not a whole lot. The pellet's going to sink pretty quickly. The same way with the, the feeler, it's going to go up fast, but it's like that glass of oil. The oil is more viscous, it will offer up more resistance, and that pellet will come down much more slowly. So while it goes up fast, it comes down at a much slower pace than the thinker. So here's the silly illustration. Now, I've gone camping, and most of you know that my idea of camping is timeshare. So I have a timeshare that has a full view of the lake. It's got a wraparound porch, it's got rocking chairs on it. Now, I've gone down to the lake, and I've gone fishing. Now, Smokey Bear is across the way, and he's fishing. He looks up, sees me, and starts running in my direction. So I look up, and I see a bear coming at me. I'm going to quickly go to my um, computer storage files in my brain about bears. Okay, um, my, I start with level on processing. I see the bear. The bear is important. Level two processing, where I'm asking the question, am I going to live through this? Am I safe or not? So level two processing says, no, I'm not safe. This is a genuine threat. And so from level two, the back of my brain, it's going to shoot down a message down my spinal column to my adrenal glands, which are all my kidneys. This is why the Apostle Paul talks about girding our loins with truth, because the seat of the emotion is the kidneys. It's where the adrenals are. So all of a sudden, I've gone from I'm safe to I'm not safe in a split second. I've realized this bear is a genuine threat. I'm not safe. This then in turn uh, is launching the adrenaline. My emotions are saying it's a legitimate reason to be at the freak out level. Um, fear and anxiety and panic kick in. And I'm able to run faster than I normally would back to the cabin because fight or flight kicks in. In this case, I'm not going to fight, I'm going to flee. And that adrenaline enables me to run faster than I normally would without it. So I get back to the cabin, I lock myself in, I'm like, oh my word, I'm safe, thank you. But I don't really have anybody to talk to to help process it beyond this, so we're dealing with trauma now. I'm not able to tell my story yet and help it come all the way to the front of my brain where it becomes a memory and where I realize, okay, I'm okay now. So I'm developing some PTSD through all of this, and I realize, okay, I'm safe, I made it, I'm changing my thinking very quickly back down to number one, but I am still shaking, and I'm still hyperventilating, and I'm still feeling an awful lot of fear in my system, but I'm catching my breath, I'm calming down, I'm thanking the Lord that I'm safe, and I'm level, leveling down to five. Okay, I'm halfway down the scale. And I, I look over in the corner of the cabin and I see, oh no, there's a snake. Now I have a personal motto about snakes. The only good snake is a dead snake. I don't like snakes. I'm not gonna be thinking, oh, it's a, it's a uh, garter snake. I'm gonna be thinking it's a copperhead, okay? And it's poisonous and I'm gonna die. So I quickly conclude I'm not safe. I'm back to processing at level two, fight or flight. I'm not going to flee. I'm going to fight. I'm back up at the fear level. I'm back up and freak out. I grab a stick, whap the snake. Turns out it's a rubber snake. So now I'm going to add to the emotion that thing called anger. I'm ready to kill whoever put that there. I'm thinking that's not funny. I'm going to get you back. You know, whatever you've done to me, I'm going to do 10 times worse. Okay, so that's where my thinking has gone berserk too, because I'm not thinking about forgiving, I'm thinking about getting revenge. But I realize I'm safe, I'm back down to level one here, but I'm, oh, I'm slowly calming down. Now, maybe by the time I get a quarter of the way, I'm at 7.5. 
And seven to 10 is what we call the irrational zone. It's very hard to take your thoughts captive when your emotions are jacked that high, very hard. And in my brain is this movie called Arachnophobia because years ago I watched it um, and in that movie, the deadly spiders were these spiders that look just like your common, everyday, dirty long legger. Now that movie was not based on truth by any shape or form. It was a stupid, silly movie. But what I remember is that those deadly spiders look just like the spider that's now running up my arm. Okay? And so I see that spider. Here's the thought, interjected thanks to sin. What if it's one of the spiders from the movie, arachnophobia, and it bites me and I die. I'm not thinking it's Daddy Longnugger, I'm thinking it's this spider from the movie. So I'm concluding I'm not safe. And I'm freaking out, anxiety, panic, fear. And I hit myself really hard, give myself a bruise, but I kill the spider. But you see, it's completely irrational reaction to the spider. Now some of you may disagree with me on that, I can think of a few names that would. But still, we've gone from the big stimulus bear to medium stimulus steak to small stimulus spider, but we wind up always at the same place, which is the freak out level. Where I'm being emotionally driven, my adrenals are being activated constantly, I'm under stress, it's going to take its toll on my body, it's taking its toll on my mind. All of it. Now, let's, let's um, switch illustrations here. Um, let's say... Um, I'm a kid who came along to two teenagers who messed around and got pregnant and were, for whatever reason, they chose to get married, whether they forced or they wanted to, it doesn't matter. But what happens is that growing up, all I hear from mom and dad is, I wish you'd never come along, you ruined our lives. If you hadn't come along, I would have gone to college. I would have been a, a star athlete on college. I would have been a cheerleader. I would have, you know, had a career, but now all I'm doing is, is working these horrible jobs that I hate, just put food on the table all because of you. I wish you would learn to do one thing right. You're the cause of all the problems. I wish you were never born. All these words of rejection are poured into me. I don't feel loved. I don't feel accepted. In fact, I feel rejected, worthless. I feel ashamed. I feel everything's my fault. And maybe even we could write down here suicidal thoughts because I feel like everybody would be better off without me. So that's how I'm flying through life. And I get this triggered so much, these messages are ingrained in me that the lowest I ever get, my new low is now a level eight. My new one is an eight. So it doesn't take much at all for me to get to that freak out level. So here's the scenario. I have one friend, one friend, and they're walking through the hall and unbeknownst to me, my friend has a physics final, and they're deathly afraid they're going to fail. So they're only at level two processing, which means they're not recognizing any faces, but they look right at me. They look right at me, and they say nothing. They don't say hi. I say hi. They say nothing. They walk right past me. What do I conclude? They hate me. I've done something. I don't know what. And now all of a sudden I'm obsessing, I'm reviewing. What did I say? What did I do? I had to do something because they only don't like me. And I've lost my best friend. Oh no, oh no, oh no, what do I do? Here's the truth. That friend is so afraid they didn't see me. They don't have a problem with me. They got a problem with a physics test. Okay? But I'm filtering everything that's going on around me through that grid of rejection and worthlessness and shame and guilt. I'm looking for reasons to validate my emotion that I'm stuck on. And I had no trouble finding it because of what was going on in my friend's life. So if I'm flying through life with a stuck feeler, and we can get stuck on any number of emotions, and all these emotions that are listed here, we were never intended to have to feel. So they are like sugar in our gas tank. They do one thing, create dysfunction. Okay. And so Satan will try to rule me. What he will want to do is to get me ruled by these emotions, get me so stuck that I become incapacitated emotionally and relationally, and even physically. So how do we unstick a stuck feeler? Well, the first thing is, we're going to look at three different ways. This is the first one. I need to come back and know truth. Now, we know that the Bible is the primary source of truth, so I need to be in the Word of God, um, cleansing my mind, washing my, my mind with the water of the Word. 
because the enemy's constantly coming at me with lies. So I've got to know the Word of God. But it's not enough to know the Word of God. For example, get back to the bear in the cabin thing. If I know that the bear has gone up and over the mountain, He's no longer out there, no longer a threat, but I'm still pinned up against the wall, freaking out. Knowing truth hasn't done me any good. You see, I have to take that step of faith. I have to apply faith to what I know. I have to choose. It's an act of the will, not of the emotion. Choose to believe it, and then my actions are going to come out of it. Many people will profess to believe such and such, and, and, but the reality is that their action is going to show you what they really, put them under pressure, you're going to see what they really believe. But our actions are the direct reflection of what our faith object is. So when I'm believing I'm safe, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to tidy up around the cabin, I'll get rid of the snake. I can't guarantee you I won't try to prank back, but, you know, hopefully I'll have forgiven and moved on. But I'll go out to the porch, I'll sit on the rocking chair. I'll enjoy the view, maybe pick up my fishing rod again, go down to the lake, start fishing again. See, the more I'm stepping out in faith that I'm safe, guess what? That last thing's going to come in line, the more I'm going to feel safe. Okay? It is the very last thing in this course. But what Satan wants to do is take number four and move it up to the number one slot. Satan wants to rule me with my emotions. Okay? Because he knows that if I put it in the number one slot, He's going to have me right where he wants me. I liken it to um, you ever see a bull with a ring in its nose. They use that ring to put a lead on it and lead them around. They literally will lead them around. The bull's going to go wherever you want him to go because you're pulling on a very sensitive area. Okay? In the same way, Satan wants to hook us with our emotions and then he'll lead us wherever he wants us to go. Um, I've had plenty of people say, well, I know the Bible says God loves me, but I don't feel like He loves me, therefore He doesn't. I know the Bible says He'll never leave me nor forsake me, but I don't feel His presence, so it must be true for everybody but me. He must have left me, and I'll blame Him because I'm such a mess up person. I don't blame Him for leaving me. I must have lost my salvation because I must not have felt sincere enough when I prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior, or I did this, that, and the other thing, so He must hate me now. Okay? The enemy wants to rule me with my emotions. This is why I have to come back to knowing the truth, believing it, acting on it, knowing then the feeling will come in line. And so there will be plenty of times where I have to choose contrary to what I feel because of what I know to be true. Okay, now this is the very first part of processing how to unstick a stuck feeler. When we get together on Sunday, we're going to talk about goals and desires, and this is going to be more hardcore. How do I take my thoughts captive? How do I spot the strategies of the enemy? And how do I maintain perspective so I'm not flying through life with a jacked up feeler? Okay, so what I encourage you to do is ask the Lord, where am I really high? Where am I really locked in at a high level? And uh, from there, we're going to progress on to the hidden chambers, which is really where we're going to start some cleansing and cleaning some of this garbage out. Okay, so this is what we covered and uh, we'll cover more on Sunday. I hope to see you then, or you'll watch the video. If not, until then, may the Lord bless you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.